The following program brought to you by Bank of America, the Bank of New York, the Irvine Company, Morgan Stanley, U.S. Bank, and Wells Fargo. This is a, a very tortured story. How do you get that kind of a return unless you're taking a lot, on a lot more risk? It's not a comedy of errors, it's really a tragedy of errors. Why is it that I don't see this guy as being that brilliant? He seems like sort of a, you know, a, a rube to me is what I thought. It wasn't the Wall Street broker's fault that this guy was a financial drunk. I mean, Wall Street is there to sell you things. It was free money, and how could you dare stop or, or even be negative about this great scheme that we've all clued into? To many people, the story of the Orange County bankruptcy begins about a year before the event, when six-term treasurer Bob Citron got an unlikely challenge to his re-election. But it actually begins a few months before that, with a trip to a meeting of the Newport Mesa School Board. I was a dad who had a daughter at Corona Del Mar High School who was just flabbergasted at these kind of risks that were being taken. Street learned his daughter's school district was borrowing tens of millions of dollars and investing it with Orange County Treasurer Bob Citron. Street knew Citron's returns were historically good, but he also knew that Citron was aggressive and relied heavily on interest rate stability. I said, well, Bob, why are interest rates going down? How do you know this? His answer is, I'm one of the largest investors in America. I know these things. So started my complete, I guess you'd call it shock and awe. When Street got a look at Citron's portfolio, it confirmed the treasurer's boast. He'd gone from investing $3 billion, which was quite impressive in, in the early 80s, to $22 billion. Bob was buying complete auctions. He was his own investment bank. This guy wasn't just a player, he was the player. But Street thought the player was playing with fire, and so did local CPA John Morlock. I would never put the orphan and the widow and the, you know, someone in, in a portfolio of this nature. I wouldn't put my most aggressive client in a portfolio of this nature. Why? Are we doing it with our tax dollars? What Morlock and Street discovered was that Bob Citron had leveraged the portfolio three times, taking money from the county, almost all of the cities in Orange County, school districts, even cities outside the county, and run it up from $7 billion to over $20 billion. They also found that the portfolio was loaded with complex securities known as derivatives. What they really are is an ability to have highly speculative positions. So he had leverage upon leverage. He had, um, he was pouring gasoline on dynamite. This was the most speculative portfolio in America. What would happen to the securities market if he blew up and went away? In early 1994, Street and Morlock met for the first time. This was such an obvious set of high risk, speculative investing that John and I just both spent the evening with big smiles on our face. So Woodward found Bernstein. Perhaps that's a good way to put it. Street gave way to Morlock to run against Citron for treasurer, a job neither really wanted to win. The more you dug, the, the deeper you realized you were going to have to fix a hedge fund. And how would you do that? Morlock ran an aggressive campaign, sent out his team's analysis to the investment pros and the media. We honestly thought there'd be a headline, Citron down $1 billion. You know, we just, we thought the, the, it would just take care of itself. The people in the industry, a lot of them had a good clue of what was going on. And they helped me behind the scenes. But they couldn't go public because they worked for A.G. Edwards, they worked for other well-known companies and those companies have a policy that if you get your name in print associated with our firm, it may cost you your job. There were lots of reasons not to believe Bob Citron's critics. In 1993, Institutional Investor had a picture on the front of their magazine, a very 
prestigious publication said, said the number one short-term investor in the world. Even the least financially sophisticated local official had to know that there was a reason, probably risk, that Bob Citroen outperformed the market year after year. But they weren't about to kill their golden goose. They loved the returns. Their councils and board members loved the returns. A lot of people um, knew that there was something extraordinary going on, but to use any other word than successful, would have caused a lot of pain and suffering. Citroen's critics got hammered, like Tustin Councilman Jeff Thomas, who got his city's money out of the pool. We were just doing what we thought was conservative for our city. That was first and foremost. Yeah, there's political overtones to it. It was during the political season. There's no question about it. But a lot of what we had uncovered during the political season is what brought it to light. So in knowing that, what do you do? You pass on that? Or do you do something about it? And said that I was a political hack, you know, and that I was coming out uh, to besmirch the good name of, of Bob Citron. He had this enormous pride and this enormous reputation he wanted to protect at any cost. If you crossed Bob Citron, it was met with retribution. Equally brash was Citron's Merrill Lynch broker, the other half of the dream team, Michael Stamenson. He absolutely was the fabled broker. For all of these reasons, the warnings of Street, of Morlock, of several others went unheeded. And Bob Citron easily won re-election to a seventh term as county treasurer. In the meantime, interest rates kept rising through the summer into the fall. You'd have Tyrannosaurus Rex, boom. You know, you'd see the whole, everything shake every time. So it was 25, 25, 25, 50, 50, 75. And, and by that time, I was just freaking out. I was screaming. Bob was in trouble, and more and more people knew that. There was, there was never any secrets here. It also appeared that there was no one else around that really understood what he was doing, so he was kind of all alone. Pierre Swan's Irvine Ranch Water District was one of Citroen's largest investors. He went to visit the county treasurer in October 94. He didn't have the systems in place to support the, the investments he was doing. Uh, he was noticeably shaken by the fact that he was a he appeared to me to be over his head and in trouble and needed help and wasn't smart enough to ask for it. He had a, a Bloomberg machine out here and that was his total you know, way of tracking a, a portfolio that was close to $20 billion. We were ready to assist. We had a team, we understood the portfolio, ready to go. And, and then, then it hit, but of course I was the town crier, I was the gadfly. And the last person that was gonna get called was the whistleblower. What I said to Bob was, uh, what I would do, Bob, if I were you, is I would get the people that sold you this stuff into the room and lock the door and not let anyone out of that room until they came up with a way to, so everyone walked out of the valley alive. As November was turning to December in 1994, the county's investment pool was in dire need of an 11th hour rescue or it would blow up. And even Bob Citron conceded that. This gentleman had gone to the meeting where Bob had asked the holders of the collateral to hold their collateral and not sell off. And he was one of the holders in the room. He had basically told me that uh, the guys went flying out of the room. I said, were they on their cell phones? He said, they were on their cell phones. I said, okay, so they're selling out their collateral right now. The fear had always been, what happens if the brokers sell Bob out? Because they really weren't secured. Is, is the county really going to allow you to sell the hospitals and the other assets? Brokers generally don't have safes of gold. They have safes of Rolodex cards. <laughs> My understanding is that the nice people from First Boston took time out of their busy day on Monday morning to sell out all of his portfolio and then literally start uh, a herd uh, running down Wall Street screaming that Orange County was going to fail. Uh, and in fact, it did. Bob Citron suddenly resigned. What I did was not irresponsible in any manner, shape, or form. Jeff Thomas called his friend John Morlock. I said, this is either the best day or the worst day of your life, however you want to look at it, John. But I think the or Orange County has just imploded as, as we speak. The Orange County Board of Supervisors were rousted out of bed in the middle of the night. I want to tell you, it was just like coming from, going to a hospital, because somebody's dying. 
The Orange County Board of Supervisors late this afternoon authorized the filing of petitions under Chapter 9 of the Bankruptcy Code. A subject that still generates debate today. Did the county have to file for bankruptcy? I think at the time we did what was right. I don't think, from what I understand, there could have been any other decision. We woke up the next day and all the chips had been called in. That what? Duh. I mean, I love these uh, Monday morning quarterbacking. Part of the reason that interest rates came down in early 1995 was the bankruptcy of Orange County, California. And the Fed then said, whoa, hold on, you know, let's stop. I can debate both sides. We could have dodged it with a little leadership. You know, you'd have to grind them and say, hey, we all got to wait it out. The loss ended up being about $1.7 billion. The county would recoup about half of that in lawsuits against Merrill Lynch and its other financial partners. Those cities and special districts which invested with the county, they were made about whole. But Orange County holds about $90 million a year in bankruptcy debt, which it will have through the year 2026. There was a lot of anger in the ensuing months, hundreds of layoffs. Don Morlock was appointed treasurer, a job he holds today. And the county created the new role of CEO. There are those who believe the Orange County bankruptcy achieved some good, that were it not for this most scarlet of letters, Chapter 9, this county and all the other municipalities would have gone on living beyond their means. There's a lot of alcoholics that said, if you just gave me a little more time, you know, I'd get over this. It was all of the discretionary programs that screamed the loudest about now that you're hurting people. You know, once something, once something starts out as a Christmas ornament and then gets to be an entitlement, and, and then really is a necessary service. But you now have rules here. The county, it did go bankrupt, but it was a special place. And it made a special change, and it made a special recovery. A visitor to Orange County today is hard pressed to see the strains of bankruptcy on the county, which now flaunts the highest average priced homes in the country and 3% unemployment. It also manages its cash a lot better. It's extraordinary. I mean, it's, uh, this, this county has gone full circle. It's now literally a model for how a large county in America should run municipal finance. But because of bankruptcy debt and the state's fiscal problems, the county had better take care of the cash it has. The county is skirting on the edge of, you know, financial crisis all the time. You know, the cuts that were put in place after the bankruptcy have kind of evaporated. Uh, they've allowed money that could have gone to pay back the, the bankruptcy debt, which is hobbling the county. In retrospect, it is clear that I followed the wrong course. Bob Citron has had little to say publicly in the last 10 years. He declined requests to participate in this program. This is not a Bob Citron, the bad guy. This is a Bob Citron, the guy who gives everybody what they want. He felt that he, he was benefiting society, that he was helping Orange County, that he could do this wonderful thing for him, and he worked very hard at it. He really believed that, that he was the good guy. It's unlikely that we're going to see, you know, anything of the size of uh, Orange County for some time. But in smaller ways, I think it's going on today. Municipalities like San Diego, as an example, okay, but all over the country um, are borrowing to finance what should be currently funded items like their own employee pension plans, which they just can't say no to people. We seem to elicit two reactions when we set about to do this 10-year retrospective on the Orange County bankruptcy. One was general interest. This story still resonates vividly, especially with those who were intimately involved with it. The second reaction was frustration that so many people allowed this to happen. It was the arrogance of not being able to admit you made a mistake and then not being able to mitigate that mistake. Right? It, it had gone too far. We're dealing with a very complex area. And in this kind of an arena, people won't admit that they don't know what they're doing. There's no excuse for saying I didn't know because we did have fiduciary responsibility. We were lulled into false security. They were falsifying the amount of money that the portfolio was earning at times. That could not have happened if there were any kind of internal controls in the county. Merrill Lynch was the doctor. Uh, 
Bob Citron was maybe the patient, okay, and they were in the Orange County Board of Supervisors where the hospital administrator, and everybody missed it, so. Uh, but the doctor should know better. In, in CPA talk, we'd, we'd say this was collusion. You know, everyone conspired together to, to do it to somebody. The CPA firm, the accountants missed it. The rating agencies looked at it and missed it. Stamenson was going overboard, and then the media buying off gullibly with that without ever hiring someone independent to say, hey, what is really going on? When you melt it down, when money talks, the truth is silent. At a recent conference, county officials, members of the media, and financial pros had a chance after 10 years to set the record straight. I think there was this sort of a culture that occurred at that time, uh, which really in some ways maybe set the stage for some missed opportunities with regard to holding um, Robert Citron and others accountable for decisions that were made. The idea of uh, the supervisors being uh, the kings and queens of their district, uh, I think has always been a problem. Bob Sitchin was a long-term county employee. He'd been there for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. He had a fabulous track record. Um, he was nominated or voted by the uh, California State Treasurer's Association as Treasurer of the Year for many years. Uh, consistently returned terrific returns. Um, when this thing uh, all started to come about, um, the county auditor had looked at the portfolio. Everything seemed to be okay. Um, outside auditors had looked at it. There were 187 participants in the pool each of them had financial managers that looked at this. Nobody raised any eyebrows, nobody said anything. As a matter of fact, in the April before the December bankruptcy, the SEC looked at the pool because of some of the allegations that were going out on the floor there, and they gave this thing a clean bill of health. So as far as we knew, everything was, everything was fine. But there had to be risk in the portfolio. Now, every risk can be hedged, can it not? I don't care whether it's a, if you're along a stock and you're afraid it's going to go down, you can short it against the box and freeze your position. I would assume that the, that the county treasurer or Citron had the ability to, if he knew he had a problem, which obviously he knew he had a problem because he had financial advisors telling him that he had a problem, why the, the portfolio wasn't hedged. It was alluded to a little, I don't know who made the comments, I guess most early and Bill must have, about the favorite supervisors. Well, how do you think the lobbyists deal with that? And how do you, all you have to do is get three more votes to get what you want. Does that make sense? Is that the way county government should be run? Uh, a CEO designation would have the responsibilities, and whether you have the title of CEO or not, you can act like a CEO. We kind of had the Wizard of Orange, uh, and it reminds me not of Dorothy and Toto standing in front of that curtain, uh, but uh, 200 uh, municipal treasurers and school board treasurers uh, and government agency treasurers kind of standing before that curtain, uh, heaping uh, praise, gushing out about uh, uh, all this great interest that was uh, being bestowed upon them by this wizard behind the curtain. Now that was before December 6th, uh, 1994. Uh, but that's the way it was, uh, not only in Orange County, uh, but from L.A. County up to the Bay Area. Uh, treasurers uh, were clamoring to, to get before that wizard's curtain. Some people knew about that. Some people knew what was behind that curtain uh, before the rest of us did, and that's called asymmetric information. Uh, Merrill Lynch knew that. The SEC knew that. The SEC uh, called Citron and the county attorney uh, up to Los Angeles in the spring of 1994. None of, none of us sitting here, including Ernie, none of us knew that that happened. Uh, and they determined that, uh, that his strategy, uh, as John Morlock was claiming, was a crock. Uh, but they decided they didn't have the, the jurisdiction. The challenger, John Morlock, has no experience in investing billions of dollars, while Citron's 24 years in office have included rising and falling stock markets. His successful stewardship of the county's money has given the supervisors funds for programs they otherwise uh, could not have afforded. The cloud drawn over Citron increasingly looks like a bum rap 
and he deserves another term, LA Times. First the flogging, and let's start with Dennis. Um, and we all did miss it, right Dennis? We all did miss it. Yes. What? <laughs> That's Anytime there's a major story out there where people are making allegations and there's a lot of money involved, and uh, we just should have found something out that was expressed in the newspaper before the actual announcement of the bankruptcy. I, I say that having worked for an editor who believed any time you got beat on any story, it was because of bad sourcing and bad work by the reporters. And I was the editor covering county government. Gene was my reporter. This was a situation where all of us, when you look back, you've got you know, there's, there's those stories that you wrote that you could just, you know, you just cringe when you look back. And I, you know, I have a couple of them uh, myself. Um, I remember I had, I had written a story about how the Irvine Company was getting into real estate investments through apartments. This, this is when the REITs first came out. And I had done a story and a lot of people were opining about how this was such a risky stra investment strategy to get involved in the real estate market. And I quoted Bob Citron. Uh, criticizing this strategy is too risky, which, you know, you look back in hindsight, it's like, oh my God. Uh, uh, but, you know, but this is a guy, you know, all of us, I think, were, uh, were not skeptical enough. One of the lessons is that we are not, as journalists, we see ourselves as crusaders, but we're not equipped very well to cover stories when everybody's on the same page, all right? When, when everyone's in cahoots, you always need a few people to leak your stuff and to give you stuff. And it's true, John was doing that and Chris Street were doing that, but they, they didn't pass the legitimacy test in, in the eye of the media. So they were coming in and delivering this stuff, and, uh, and everybody was looking at them very skeptically. Before Orange County, there was the SNL crisis. Post Orange County, from Parmalat to Martha Stewart to Enron, more training, like you get new journalists? Uh... I think we have uh, paid more attention to business and business reporting. I don't know that it's translated into more training for government reporters. Uh, other than we're much better with computers and spreadsheets and computer-assisted reporting, and we're much uh, more aggressive in terms of pairing ourselves up with people in the business staff if it's a business story with government and political overtones. I remember I lived through it. I was, you know, working, you know, 18-hour days, and every, you know, everybody else wasn't it. And you know, it was it was t it was horrible. It just, it, you know, it struck all of us because you just realized how bad this was. Well, the vendors who were, especially the smaller vendors. Yeah, there were a lot of companies that, yeah, they they didn't get paid and and uh, employees lost their jobs and it was just it was you know really something that was very traumatic and um, I, I suppose we should all be heartened by the fact that the public, uh, you know, things things are going well. But I think that that doesn't erase our responsibility to continue to ask questions. GASB 31, Government Accounting Standards Board, statement number 31, uh, requires that we mark portfolios to market now. Uh, that, I believe, was an offshoot at, uh, of uh, the Orange County bankruptcy. The crazies, they call all the time. You go to your council meeting, you go to the board meeting, and there's the gadfly and they're babbling on it. You know, and you, you know, it's, Shakespeare knew that the fool in King Lear was not the fool, but had the good, all the good lines. But in the real world, a lot of them are fools. So it's really hard to sort through this. But ultimately, you know, this, in this case, you know, the fool had the good lines. And if we had listened to them, maybe the world would have taken a different, and I mean that with all due respect. Incestuous <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, relationship between uh, city managers. Uh, they all seem to, to know each other. They all seem to went to the same high school together and you know let, let's get Bob his job because Charlie knows him and he's a good guy uh, sort of thing and nobody asks any questions so uh, that's one reason why you have 180 uh, treasurers standing up uh, for Bob Citrone is because uh, um, they simply don't know the, what the questions to ask. Apparently 19 percent, only 19 percent of county residents realized there ever was a bankruptcy in Orange County and that's in this county. So if you go further and further away, I mean, the Orange County bankruptcy to me was a life-changing event. It was a major development in my career. It's a case study in municipal finance for anybody who's in, in the municipal bond business, but that's a very small minority. The great majority of people don't have a clue it ever happened. The difference, I think, for Orange County today is that in Bob Citron's time, he was really an entity of himself. He was an elected official, it was a nonpartisan office, and although he may have been a Democrat or although he may have been whatever, um, Bob was his elected and this was his portfolio and his customers, only one of the customers, was the county. 
he had all these other customers that, that supported him. Today, the level of visibility of this particular portfolio is astronomical. I could never find anybody that regulated a, a, a treasure. That has changed. And I think one of the changes that's taken place is not only institutionally with some of the changes in the law, but the personality who's been running the Treasury for the last 10 years has put an institutional stamp on the importance of scrutiny, on the importance of transparency that will live here for a long, long time. So this was really, uh, really, really something uh, to behold tonight. This is very unique. It's very historic. And I'm glad we could kind of have a reunion and all be in the same room. I, uh, I had a friend drive down to my office right after I lost in June. And, and he said something really profound. He says, I, he said, God told me to come and talk to you, and which is really kind of hokey, weird to me anyway. But, but I said, okay, I'll listen. And he said, John, you've got to be better, not bitter. And I think tonight we're all better.